Hello, today I'm going to be talking about the board game uh, Rum and Bones Second Tide. I believe this came out in 2017, at least that's what it shows on the Board Game Geek website. Um, I believe it was a Kickstarter and there were a lot of uh, extra factions and stuff that you could get. The base game, which I bought, uh, and I didn't get it on the Kickstarter, I think I bought it on Amazon or something afterwards, just comes with two factions, but... I believe there were a lot of other factions available to purchase but as I said the base game comes with two factions so that's uh, all I'll be uh, talking about in this video um, last time I played it well I played it yesterday just to refresh myself on the rules but the first and only time I played it uh, against another person was in 2019 we enjoyed it so hopefully I'll get it played again uh, sometime soon. But uh, let's go ahead and get started with setup. First thing you do is the players will choose a faction. Uh, as I said, the two factions in the base game are the Deep Lords and the Marea de la Muerte. So one player will choose one faction, one player will choose another, and choose. then they will choose three of the heroes from that faction. The base game I believe comes with five possible heroes for each faction so you'll select a faction and then choose three of the five possible heroes from that faction. Once you've selected the heroes for your faction you'll take a base matching that faction so for the Deep Lords you take the blue bases for the uh, Maria de la Muerte you take these I don't know, gold colored bases and place your figure, hero figure in those bases. Now, I did <clears throat> do my normal mediocre paint job on these hero figures. Um, I did not uh, paint the uh, crew figures, which I'll show shortly. But anyway, you'll put a colored base that matches your faction on each of your heroes. You'll take the matching hero dashboard for each of your heroes. You'll also take the corresponding skill cards that go along with your heroes. So for this hero, Ishmael, you take the three corresponding skill cards. Each faction will also have a crew. This is not a hero. This is just a, a crew dashboard that goes along, matches your hero dashboard. And then you'll take the matching crew figures that go with uh, the color of your faction. So you'll see the deck hands are these models with a square base. Then there's different uh, models that all have the square base and those are the deck hands. So there's three rows of those. And then the bosun has the circle base and there's fewer of those so you take the ones for your faction now again these are for the deep lords and this is the crew for the Maria de la Muerte and again the square bases the three rows uh, with the square bases are the deck hands and they all you know have the same skills they're just different models for the same thing and the models with the round bases are the bosuns each player will take their matching tide deck. So this is the tide deck for the uh, Deep Lords. You'll shuffle that. There's also um, some upgrade cards for the deck gun and the bosun. So you'll just place those somewhere near the crew dashboard um, for if you end up getting those upgrades. On your hero dashboards, if they have a basic attack, you find the corresponding skill card basic attack and go ahead and um, start with it in its slot on the level 1 side. Each card will have a level 1 and a level 2 side. So, uh, so for example, here for Carcarius, you put the his basic attack feeding frenzy on the level 1 side. For Ishmael here, his basic attack... Um, starts on the level one so you'll do that with all your heroes for their basic attack and you'll see that these don't have a cost that's why you can place your basic attack on there to begin with if any of your heroes other slots have a 
uh, no cost or a cost of zero you can go ahead and start with that so you see these have an upgrade or an initial cost of three um, but you can see over here uh, this quartermaster on the Morela uh, de la Muerte they have an initial cost of zero for this uh, reaction skill so he can place that on the level one side for free but you'll notice it says no effect until leveled up and we'll talk about more about leveling those up later you then place the game boards uh, on the in the table between all players it uh, consists of the deep lord ship the gallant and then the two other ships on the other side of the gallant are the uh, Maria de la Muerte's wind cutter ships. If you've got expansions with different factions, then they will come with different ships. And the back of the rule book shows the different configurations uh, that you will place the boards in for those different ships. But in the base game, which is what we're playing, this is the configuration um, for the two factions and their ships. You'll then place the gangplanks in between the ships as shown here. There is a diagram in the instruction manual that shows how to place all the tokens that I'm about to place here on the board. So that's what you'll refer to, but I'll just show you as I'm placing them where they go. Next you'll place objective tiles. So on the wind cutters, um, you put the rigging line here in this space. The wheel on this space over on the other wind cutter you put the uh, ammo reserves on this space the captain's chest on this space and the armory on this space on the deep lord ship you'll put the armory up here on the furthest uh, space the rigging line on this space the main mast on this space the wheel on this space and the ammo reserves on this space. Again, these are objectives, and those will be uh, points that the enemy will want to try to destroy, and they will gain uh, victory points and treasure from doing that. You will then place these tokens. Um, these are for the Deep Lord ship. These are deployment tokens. That's where uh, figures will be able to deploy when they first come onto the ship. And for the Maria de la Muerte faction, you'll place one deployment token here and here on this ship, and one deploy deployment token here and here on this ship. And again, all this can be seen here in the rules manual on how to set up this ship and where to place the objectives and deployment points and so forth. All right, then on the Deep Lord ship, you'll take 12 deck hands you'll place four on the rigging line objective four on the main mast objective and four on the wheel objective again it doesn't matter which ones you place where you can mix and match the different models just as long as they have a square base they are a deck hand and you place 12 out four on each of those objectives Similarly, for the Maria de la Muerte faction, you'll take 12 uh, deck hands. You'll put uh, four on the rigging line, four on the captain's wheel, and over on this other ship, four on the captain's chest. And again, as long as they have a square base, uh, they're all deck hands, so you can mix and match the models. It doesn't really matter. Each player will draw three of their tide cards into their hand. Finally, you'll put your dice somewhere near the board. You'll also put your damage tokens, activation tokens, uh, condition tokens, dead man tokens, and treasure um, somewhere near the board. You place your Kraken and any sea creature uh, dashboards nearby. The base game only comes with one sea creature. The sea dragon, uh, but apparently, uh, or sea monster, the sea dragon, but apparently in expansion you can get more. Uh, the Kraken dashboard and their corresponding 
tiles go nearby the board. Place the score dashboard somewhere near the board. You put your uh, crack and pool tokens on zero, as well as your scoring tokens on zero for each player. Then you'll randomly roll a die. Each player will roll a die, uh, or, and higher roll will be first player, or however you want to choose to be first player. And you'll place the first player marker on whichever side that player is sitting. So if my first player is going to be here, the Deep Lords, I'll put the first player token here when it switches over to uh, uh, the Maria de la Muerte faction being the first player. The next turn, you just move the token over like that. And that completes setup. Got everything set up. As you can see, it takes up quite a bit of my little table here. This is my little, you know, dice tray, which I'm sure you've seen quite a few times if you've uh, watched any of my videos where I'm playing a game with ships. But this is a dice tray my daughter made for me, and that's what I roll my dice in. It's starting to fall apart. Um, so we're ready to go. So let's uh, move on to how to play. All right, so the game is played over a series of rounds. Rounds consists of players' turns. So what a player will do on their turn, starting with the first player, they can activate one of their heroes, activate uh, their crew, or pass. Once they've done that, activated one of their heroes, or activated their crew or pass, then the... Uh, other player gets to do the same, activate one of their heroes, one of their crew and pass, and go back and forth until uh, each player has activated all the um, heroes and crew that they can or want to. And um, once that's done, you move on to another phase in the round called Unleash the Kraken, and then finally you go to the recovery phase, and then that ends the round. So let's talk about on a player's turn uh, what they can do when they activate a hero or their crew. All right, so if you're going to activate a hero, if, if he's not already on the board, you can put him on the board on one of your uh, side's deployment points. Of course, you can only activate a hero if it doesn't already have an activation token on it, meaning that it was uh, already activated, um, or if it has a dead man's coin on it, um, which you'll get from being uh, KO'd or knocked overboard, um, that kind of thing, and we'll talk about that later. But um, So at the beginning of the round, you can activate a hero, as I said, if it's or at the beginning of your turn. Um, if it's not already on the board, and you can place it on the board because it's not previously activated or has a dead man's token, then you place it on one of your deployment points, so one of your choice. Of course, if it is already on the board, um, then you don't have to deploy it. You can just start taking actions with it from where it is. So once it's deployed, or if it's already on the board and you activate it, your hero can take three actions. And your possible actions are to move, or use a skill. So we'll talk about move first. When you use a move action, you get two movement points. So a movement point can be used to simply move to one uh, zone. So you can move one zone for a movement point. Now the zones with the solid square are legal zones. These zones with the uh, dashed squares are uh, C zones, you cannot move into a C zone. However, you can, um, with one movement point, do a uh, rigging check where you are trying to cross onto another ship um, using the rigging that's hanging above the ships. Um, so to do that, you need to be on one of the zones that is adjacent to the sea zones between ships. So you, you could be in one of these um, zones, or one of these zones, or one of these zones, or one of these zones, and then you can try to 
rig to get across to the other ship. So we'll say this hero, we'll say this hero activated, got deployed here. Maybe they, uh, they so for one action they do a move action, so they spend one movement point to move here. For their other movement point, they're going to rig across the to this ship. Now you determine where you want to land on the other ship, um, and however many spaces that is, you roll a die, and if you roll equal to or greater than that, then you're safe. If you roll, roll less than that, then you fall overboard. So, for example, if this player was here and they wanted to use their uh, second movement point to rig uh, maybe to uh, this space, they just need to roll a two or better. So they would get a die, roll, they got a six, so they easily made it. And they would then put their uh, hero there. And that would be the end of that move action because they, they spent both movement points uh, to do that. And whenever you're determining movement, um, you can never go diagonal. It's always orthogonal. So if you were going to you know, try to rig from here to you know, this space here, it would be you know, one, two, three, four. So you'd have to roll a four or better. It'd be the same way if you went here, one, two, three, four. You'd have to roll a four or better. And of course that would be a failure, so you would go overboard and I'll talk what the, I'll talk about what going overboard penalty for that is here shortly. But I just want to show for one action, you can do a move action which gives you two movement points, so you can just move two spaces. Or you can move a space and rig, or rig and move a space however you want to spend your two movement points. And as I said, you get three actions, so you could do the move action, then do the move action again and get another two movement points, um, etc. But another thing you can do, of course, is to use a skill. And your skills are what you have here on your uh, hero board. So, of course, your basic attack, that's an attack skill. So that would be one action if you wanted to use your basic attack. And this just shows this is the number of dice you roll. Three. This is what you need to get to get a hit. So a three plus. So you could roll three dice. You hit on a three plus. And this is the range. So this, this attack can attack up to two spaces away. So if this hero was going to use a skill, an attack skill, to attack uh, these deck crew here. She could do that from this space because that's two spaces away and that is her range. So she would roll three dice for each result of three or greater. She would uh, get a hit and get to remove one, uh, one of these deck hands. So deck hands and bosons, it only takes one hit to kill them. Heroes, as you can see, have health on their hero sheet. So she takes six hits before she's KO'd. Ishmael here takes 12 hits before he's KO'd. Uh, Karkarian uh, takes 10 hits. So when a hero takes an amount of hits that doesn't KO them, then you just take these hit tokens. You know, if, if this hero took two hits, you just put those hit tokens on there signifying they have two hits. If ever their hit equals um, the value shown here, that's the total amount of hits they could take, and then they're KO'd. And I'll talk more about what happens when a hero is KO'd um, in a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of show how the attack skill works. The other kind of skills you have are abilities. So, um, for instance, this player, this hero here, Bayana, she can, um, at a cost of three, get this high cost of living ability then she would put this card on there and then she has this ability it cost one of her actions to do it um, this one is discard any number of treasure from Viana deal one enemy hero within two zones that much damage if this hero is KO'd a hero draws one tied card um, so again another type of um, action you can spend as one of your abilities and uh, 
to do whatever is on that ability card. Of course, she doesn't start with this. She has to uh, pay to get that. You'll notice that Viana here has, this one is a passive ability. It's just written onto the hero uh, player board there. That does not take an action. It just um, takes effect whenever um, this one says, like for hers, it's when Viana activates, steal up to one treasure from an enemy hero and place it on a friendly hero. If you have less victory points than enemy hero, steal up to two. So that doesn't take an action to do. That's a passive skill, and it just, um, you know, you can just do it for no action cost. So if a uh, skill has this icon, then it's an ability skill. If a skill has this kind, this icon, it's an attack skill. Both of those do cost an action to use. Some skills have this icon, which is a reaction skill, and that does not cost an action to use. Now you'll see here on, uh, what's his name, El Latigo, he starts with this um, reaction skill level one, but it does him no good, so he would have to pay three treasure to upgrade that and then he can flip it over and then you'll see when an enemy hero would gain treasure from KO and crew the opponent has to choose one, one of your blah blah blah. Anyway once this happens that's a reaction um, it doesn't cost him an action to do it um, but once this is used then you have to flip it back to level one and then it would cost and he would have to pay to flip it back over again but anyway uh, reaction skills and um, passive skills do not cost an action to use. So let's talk about unlocking skills and leveling, leveling up skills. So unlocking skills is one that you don't have, like this high cost of living. You can see it costs three treasure for her to unlock that. Once she unlocks that, she gets the level one card and puts it on there. It does not cost an action to unlock a skill. You can do it at any time on your turn um, if, you if you have the treasure. As well, you'll see, once you have a skill, um, if it has the arrows up on it, an amount of treasure with arrows up, that's a level up. So, for instance, she could level up her attack skill for five treasure. Again, you can level up any time on your turn. Um, as long as you have the treasure, it does not cost an action. And when you level it up, you just flip it over to its level 2 side. You'll see this gives her a little bit better attack. She rolls 5 dice and hits on 4 plus instead of, you know, 4 dice and hitting on 4 plus. So some of these skills uh, you're able to level up. And again, you can level up or unlock at any time on your turn without spending an action as long as you have the amount of treasure shown to do it. Now each hero can only use um, their, their skills one time per activation except for their basic attack. Their basic attack they could use it more than once. Of course it still costs an action so like if you wanted to spend uh, all three of your actions doing a basic attack against somebody um, then you could do that but uh, if you had if you had unlocked this uh, you know fury of the deep attack action it is not a basic attack so you could only do that once per activation so even though you have three actions um, and you were within range of somebody to attack, you could not do this attack three times. You could do this one once, and then that would leave you two more actions where you could do your basic, basic attack if that's how you wanted to spend it. All right, let me talk a little bit more about movement. Um, I think I mentioned when I was talking about movement, you can't move into C zones or diagonal. You can also not move uh, into or through a zone containing enemy figures. And a hero um, can move through an enemy deployment zone, but they cannot end their movement on an enemy deployment zone token. 
Um, let's talk a little bit more about combat. So I've shown that you can use your attack skills to attack enemies uh, in range of whatever attack you're doing. However, uh, let's say this enemy hero was in with this group of enemies and you were attacking this zone. You always attack a zone, not an individual uh, figure. So, uh, say for instance, if Ishmael was doing his attack, he gets to roll four dice and hits on uh, four plus. He also has this little ability push heroes hit up to one zone and he can only his range is just one zone so if he was here these are one zone away he could attack here so he would roll four dice <laughs> he got no no four pluses so that would be zero hits but we'll just say he got a five and a four so we'll say he got two hits you have to prioritize your hits um, first deck hands so he couldn't apply those two hits to this hero if he wanted to because there are deck hands that can be hit first so you always have to hit and eliminate deck hands first then if you've applied all your hits to all the deck hands there then you can target bosons second remember those are the ones with the circle bases there's none on the board at start, but uh, those have to be, those are your second priority. So after all deck hands are eliminated in the zone you're attacking, then you can eliminate bosons with hits. If bosons are eliminated, then you can apply your hits to heroes. Now some people's attacks, like for instance, uh, here, Kyria and Carl's basic attack, says they may prioritize heroes. So if they made an attack, rolling three dice and hitting on three plus, they could prioritize the hero and apply their hits straight to the hero instead of the deck hands. But unless your attack says you may prioritize heroes, then you have to follow you know, deck hands first, then bosons, then heroes. And then finally, once all those are eliminated, then you could apply your attacks to the objective underneath. So that's the last thing in the priority line. And this takes six uh, hits to eliminate. So let's talk about what you get for uh, eliminating um, crew, you know, deck hands and bosons. So if a hero uh, attacks and uh, eliminates deck hands and bosons, they get one treasure for each one that they eliminate. Anytime a hero KOs an enemy hero, they get three treasure. And again, that's just these coins here. Um, the ones that look like this are just singles, and then there's some in here that are value three. But if you eliminate an enemy hero, um, that's worth uh, three treasure and a victory point. So your side moves their token up on the victory point track of the scoreboard uh, here. If you eliminate an objective, you get what's shown on that objective. So if you eliminate this objective, um, that's worth two victory points. So you'd get to move up two on the victory point track. You would get uh, three coins, three treasure for each of your heroes that are on your sides for your faction. We'd each get three treasure. And then some of them give a little bonus like this one. Um, after it's destroyed, one hero may move up to five zones. All right, let's talk about what happens when a hero gets KO'd. So if one of your heroes takes enough damage that it equals its health value, equals or exceeds its health value, then it is KO'd. So at that point, you remove the figure from the board, place it back on its hero sheet, uh, remove the damage, um, tokens just place them back in the pool of damage tokens if they had a condition token uh, you would remove that 
Um, we haven't talked about condition tokens yet, but I'll talk about those here in a minute. But if, if your hero that is KO'd had a condition token or more than one on it, they would be removed. Then, if that hero had already been activated that round, in other words, um, when you activate a hero and they take their three actions, after they're done taking their actions, you put an activation token on their hero sheet or hero dashboard um, and so that lets you know that you've already activated that hero that round and they can't be activated again that round so if your hero is KO'd and they've already activated that round then you'll take a dead man's uh, token and put it with the dark side facing up on their hero dashboard if the hero that's KO'd had not already been activated the, this round, then you place the dead man's coin with the shiny side up on their hero dashboard. And a KO'd hero will return, I mean, <laughs> will retain any uh, treasure or skills or anything that they already have. So they don't lose anything other than... Um, getting a dead man's coin um, either dark side up or light side up and that kind of determines if they can deploy um, when they can deploy again because um, you cannot deploy um, a hero that uh, has a dead man's coin on their um, command sheet or an activation token on their, not their command sheet, their hero dashboard. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Let's talk about uh, the effects of being pushed overboard now. So I mentioned if you try a, um, to rig from one ship to another and you do a rigging check and you fail, then you go overboard and you place your, uh, you have to take your hero's figure and place it uh, on its side on your um, heroes dashboard also you can go overboard some uh, heroes or effects <clears throat> that are attacking you may allow them to push you and they can push you in any direction and the effect you know may say how many spaces so for instance you know Ishmael here has this where he can push hit heroes up to one zone so if this hero was here and Ishmael was attacking him and hit him and pushed him, he could push him into the C zone, which would knock him overboard. So again, when some effect uh, makes you go overboard, you place your figure on its side on your uh, hero dashboard. You place an activation token on their dashboard, so um, even if they had not been activated that turn, um, they get marked as if they had been activated. And if that was their turn and they were making a rigging check and failed and went overboard, then their turn ends immediately and, you know, so they get an activation token. And that's it. They'll be able to come back and redeploy in a future round. All right, so we've talked about... Um, hero actions, uh, deploying heroes and taking actions with your hero, that's one thing you can do on your turn. The other thing you can do is uh, activate your crew. So um, whenever you activate you, your crew, first thing you'll do is select your three of your friendly deployment points. Now the Deep Lords only have three, but the uh, <laughs> Maria de la Muerte have four deployment points but anyway when you activate your crew you'll select three of your deployment points and put two deck hands on each of them so in this case if it was the deep lords they would be putting two two deck hands on each of the each of their deployment points and again if it was the Maria de la Muerte they would select three of their deployment points and put two deck hands on each of them then you'll select two bosons and you can deploy them um, 
on any of your deployment points. You can put them both on one or on separate ones. So maybe, you know, uh, this guy would put one here and maybe one here. So remember the bosons are the ones with the circle. And basically what they do is give a little uh, help to the deck hands. Well, first they get to attack with two dice and hit on a three plus. But also if they are in a zone with deck hands, those deck hands get a plus one to hit. Um, um, so instead of hitting on a four plus, they would hit on a three plus as well. So if they're in a zone with deck hands, they give them a bonus as well as having their own attack. All right, so again, when you activate your crew, first thing you'll do is deploy two deck hands onto three of your deployment points. Then you'll take two bosons and deploy them onto any two of your deployment points. Or not, they doesn't have to be on two. They could be all put on one. So they just have to go on one of your deployment points or two of them. However you want to split them up. But it's two bosons go on a friendly deployment point. Then, in whichever order you wish, you fire your deck gun and then move and attack with your crew. Or you can move and attack with your crew and then fire your your deck gun. You choose the order in which you want to do that. If you fire, when you fire your deck gun, you simply you can pick, it has unlimited range, so you can choose any target, but as you can see, it cannot uh, damage deck features, which are the uh, objective tiles here. So you couldn't target those with your deck gun, but you could target a zone with enemies in it anywhere again it has unlimited range so you just choose a zone um, with enemies or a hero that you want to attack and then you get to roll four dice and hit on a um, four plus so that's the deck gun so again you can fire that before you move an attack with your crew or after you move an attack with your crew all right then as far as moving and attacking with your crew the crew move in a uh, predetermined fashion so the crew are trying to move toward enemy deployment points so again first thing you'll do is move and deploy or move and then attack with your crew so in this case if we were doing the deep lords the way they move is um, they each will move one zone so these guys would move one zone to here then these guys would move one zone to here these guys would move one zone to here in here with Ishmael then these guys would move one zone here these guys would move one zone forward here and then these guys would move up here and so their full track would be every time they move they'll move one zone so they would move from this deployment point this way and then eventually try to meet, to land on this deployment point. Now, of course, once they um, they cannot move into a zone with other uh, figures, so if they got to here, they wouldn't be able to move into here. They would just have to attack. So again, they would move one zone um, here, as I said, and then if there were figures adjacent to them or within their range, then they could attack. And they attack uh, exactly as I said for each figure in there. They get to roll, the deck hands get to roll one dice and hit on a four plus. For each boson in there, they get to roll two dice and hit in a three plus. And if a boson is in with a group of deck hands, they would hit on three plus instead of four plus as well. So that's the way the deep lords move. They would move this way, uh, this way, and this way. The Maria de la Muerte. Kind of the same, they would move from this deployment point trying to get to this deployment point. These guys would move from here up this way trying to get to this deployment point. And these guys would move this way trying to get to this deployment point. But again, every time they activate, they just move one zone. So it's, it takes a while for them to get where they're trying to get. And they'll you know likely meet up with being adjacent to enemy figures where they won't be able to move in past them, they'll have to attack them. And we'll see examples of that um, 
when we get to the uh, example turns. And they could attack more than one zone. For example, if the uh, this uh, crew, the Maria de la Muerte, was activating their crew, so these guys would move forward one zone, and then they would have. Then they, after they move, then they can attack. So they could attack. All four of them could attack here, or all four of them could attack here, or you could have two of them attack here and two of them attack here. However, you want to do that um, again, so they they don't have to target um, all one zone together. Some could target another zone as long as it's within their range. And of course, the way I've mentioned that the uh, crew move uh, is defined by the ship configuration. So. In this particular, with the core set, having these ships and these factions, that's the, the way these um, figures will move. If you have different ships, different factions, uh, and your board configuration is different, then they will move differently. And it's, and it's shown in the rules how they'll move. So, for example, in the rule book here, you can see that it shows, you know, for the Deep Lords, they'll move this way and opposite for the Maria de la Muerte so it gives the shows the direction of how the crew will move if the crew is attacking a zone and they manage to kill every so you know for example you know these guys uh, four deck hands if they were attacking here and they rolled their four dice let's just see what we get so they don't have a boson with them, so they just get to roll one dice each and hit on four plus. So here they would just they would just get one hit. They would remove one of these figures. But let's just say they they managed to wipe out. They got four hits and managed to wipe out all the deck hands there. If they clear a zone with their attack, then they get to move forward into that zone. They don't get to make another attack again, so if there were more figures here, they would not get to make another attack against those figures, but they do get to move into a zone if they uh, clear all the figures out from that zone with their attack. Now, of course, that's only if that zone is on their movement track. For example, if they were here and they attacked Carcarius here and managed to uh, defeat him and KO him, they would not move into this space because that's not along their movement track. So they would only move into a space that's along their movement track if they managed to uh, defeat all the enemies in that space. But they wouldn't uh, move off of their movement track if they defeat somebody. If a crew does manage to make it all the way to the deployment point at the end of their uh, movement track, then... Um, what they do is called ransacking and pillaging so you'll remove the figures that made it to that deployment point and for every figure that you remove you get to make one attack against any enemy deck feature or hero um, so rolling a dice for each figure that you remove that made it there and uh, hitting on a three plus and again that's that's only crew uh, heroes can never land on a um, enemy deployments point as I sp spoke about when I was talking about hero movement they can pass over an enemy deployment point but they can't land on one but if the crew reach the end of their track which is an enemy deployment point then uh, for each crew that made it there you remove you remove them roll a die and they get to make an attack on an enemy hero or deck feature hitting on three plus and uh, that's it for crew so after uh, you fired your deck gun moved an attack with your crew then you put an activation token on your uh, crew dashboard and they can't be activated again that round all right we've talked about activating heroes we've talked about activating crew um, let's talk about the tide cards so you remember at the start um, during setup, each 
player got to draw three tied cards and basically you can use the these whenever they say like for instance this one says when a friendly hero attacks if you play this push heroes hit up to one zone blah 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 this one at the start of a friendly heroes activation so whenever it says then that's when you can play that tied card and you can play as many tied cards um, as you have um, normally that's only three um, but at the end of the round you'll draw back up to three in the recovery phase which we'll talk about here shortly this one when an enemy hero damages a deck feature on your ship roll a die and three plus so anyway some of them though as you'll notice have this kraken symbol on the bottom so whenever you play a tide card that has a crack and sometimes they'll have two crack and symbols on them whenever you play one that has that symbol or has more than one symbols you'll move your crack and pool token token up uh, the number of symbols that are on that card that you played so maybe at the end of the first round um, you know one player played cards that rose their uh, crack and pool up two and one player just played one that rose their crack and pool up one that matters because when we get into the next phase which I'm going to talk about after both players have activated all the crew and heroes that they have um, can activate then you move into the really unleash the kraken phase of the round so the first thing you'll do is if the uh, kraken is not already on the board or has not already been eliminated then you'll test the waters to do that both players will each roll one die and if the result total like here is four is less than or equal equal to the combined total of the kraken pool so right here our combined total is three and we got a four so it would not be less than but if it was less than then that would unleash the kraken since it's not then we wouldn't have to worry about it this round but as you can see, as the Kraken pool goes up from playing tide cards, um, then every round it's going to be a little more, uh, a little bit better of a chance that the Kraken will be unleashed. If and when you do roll less than the Kraken pool when you're testing the waters, then you unleash the Kraken. You take the Kraken tile and you place it in between the two uh, gangplanks there on the board. If there was any sea monster in one of those spaces, then it would be immediately KO'd. The sea monster uh, comes into play from uh, a tide card. A player can play a tide card that lets them place the sea monster in a sea zone and activate it just at like similar to activating one of their heroes. It is not a hero, but they activate it and use it um, just like if they were activating one of their heroes. Um, but if it was in one of these spaces when the Kraken is active, is unleashed, then it would be KO'd. So then next, after the Kraken is unleashed and placed on the board, and in every future round where it is still on the board, then the Kraken will attack. So the first thing you'll do is roll a die, and hopefully you get it in your... And then you look on the uh, Kraken dashboard which you'll just place somewhere nearby, but I'll just set it here to look at it. And we rolled a six, so you would look and see, oh, okay, we got a six, so the Kraken will do this attack. And I should have mentioned, you'll see here on the Kraken dashboard, that when the Kraken is deployed, deal three damage to all heroes whose Kraken pool, whose Kraken pool has the highest, whose is the highest, basically. Um, or to all heroes in case of a tie. So the Kraken will remain there and every round after the players do their <clears throat> complete activating their heroes and crew then you'll uh, have the um, Kraken attack until the Kraken is eventually defeated 
and you'll, you can see that he's got 16 health. But if he is defeated, you can see it's worth three victory points to the uh, player that defeats him. And two treasure, and I'm assuming that's similar to a deck feature where it will be two treasure to every hero on the side that defeats him. And then once he's defeated, he's just removed. Now I mentioned that tide cards can increase the tide pool, but there are other things like uh, Carcarius has this skill where um, he can increase his Kraken pool by one after rolling and then each hit of five that he rolled uh, he gets to roll one additional one additional die now that's optional so when you see a skill that has uh, something like that that says you can increase your crack and pool by one to do something that's always optional but if you do of course that raises the crack and pool and obviously makes it a better chance that the kraken will be unleashed so uh, after you test the waters and do or do not unleash the kraken of course obviously if you don't unleash it and he's not already on the board then he won't attack finally you'll just go to the recovery phase First thing in the recovery phase, you can discard any tide cards you still have in your hand that you don't want and then draw back up to three. So, you know, maybe if you've played one and still have two in your hand, but you don't like the two you have, you can discard those and draw back up to three. Um, but you'll always draw back up to three. Of course, if you've got more than three in your hand because of uh, some game effect, then you wouldn't draw any unless you discarded. Next thing uh, in the recovery phase, if any hero has a dead man's coin on its light side, then you remove it, and that hero will be able to be deployed in the next round. If a hero has a dead man's coin on its dark side, then you would flip it to its light side, and that hero will not be able to be deployed during the next round. You would have to wait until the uh, end of that next round um, in the recovery phase when that coin will be removed because it's on its light side so basically if it's on its dark side you're not going to be able to activate that hero in the next round it'll just get flipped back to its light side and you'll have to wait around before he can be activated he or she can be activated again you then remove activation tokens from any heroes or crew that do not have a dead man's coin and then pass the first player token to the other side so the player who was not first that round will be the first player the next round and so you just continue like that until the first player to get eight victory points and then they win the game I will just mention that uh, there's a, a upgrade for the deck gun and the bosun so if you destroy you know this deck feature it says upgrade your deck gun when you do that you just take this deck gun upgrade and put it on your crew uh, dashboard and it shows what the upgrade for the deck gun is similarly if you destroy the armory that upgrades the bosun and you take your bosun upgrade and place it on your crew sheet so uh, again, when it's uh, your turn, um, you, hack, you have to activate uh, a hero or crew if you have one that you can activate. And then the next player, after they've done whatever they're going to do, then the next player and go forth. Once you have no more heroes or crew that you can activate, then you pass. And if the other player still has heroes and crews, or crew they can activate they'll do that until they're complete and then that uh, that will end the that phase of the game and then you'll move on to the unleash the kraken phase i just wanted to mention that you can't pass as long as you still have heroes or crew that you can activate but haven't ha ha haven't activated yet and then i just wanted to talk one more time about uh, when you'll get coins and victory points so anytime that a hero uh, eliminates a crew a deckhand or a bosun 
then they will get a coin for each one they eliminated. Anytime a hero eliminates another hero, KOs another hero, then, that, then they gain three treasure and one victory point for their faction. If a hero is eliminated not from another hero but from another effect like a crew attack or a deck gun attack or a tide card or something like that, then uh, their faction is still awarded one victory point and each of their heroes gains one uh, treasure. Each of the side that was not eliminated. And of course you gain uh, treasure and victory points from eliminating deck features as I mentioned. Also eliminating the Kraken and uh, if a player does use a tide card to uh, deploy the sea monster on their side then uh, if you defeat that it's just like defeating a hero so you'll gain uh, you know um, three gold which if a hero defeats it then they'll gain three gold and a victory point for their side all right i think i've uh, pretty much covered most of the rules there may be something here or there that i missed but i think i covered it for the most part it may have <laughs> may have been a little confusing i think uh, you know since i do this unscripted sometimes i get out of sequence and it may sound a little wishy-washy i don't know but i'm going to go ahead now and do a few example turns and i think that should uh, if you were questioning anything i think the example turns uh should solidify it for you and uh, give you a good idea of how the game works. So let's get started with our example turns. All right, I think I've got everything set back to how it was right after setup. The uh, Deep Lords will be my first player. So they can activate uh, one of their heroes or their crew. Um, since none of their heroes are deployed, if they activate one, they put it on the deployment point. So we'll say that's what we're going to do. He's going to activate his Captain Carcarius. He'll put him on this deployment point. And now he has three actions he can take. And the actions he can take are to move or use a skill. The only skill he has right now is his basic attack. So uh, there's not a skill he can use at this point. So he's going to move. So, for his first move, he's going to try to, or he's going to use a move action that gives him two movement points. So, with his first movement point, he's going to try to rig to this space here. So, one, two, three. So, he needs a three, a three or better. Oh, one. <laughs> well, that sucks. So, he falls, he uh, falls over, or goes overboard. So, we place him in there and he gets a activation token and that was a lame beginning okay so now the Maria de la Muerte uh, faction it's their turn so they can activate a hero or their crew so they're gonna activate uh, Gabriella the gunner um, so she can go on one of their deployment points so she's gonna go on this one and now she can be begin taking her actions. So she's going to do a move action. She's going to, with one of her movement points, she's going to move here. And with her second movement point, she is going to try to uh, rig. But she's just going to try to go here. So one, two. So she needs a two or better. Uh, good. She got a two. So she's successful. She successfully rigs over there. So that's one action. She used her, her move action. For two movement points so she has two more actions she's going to use a second action and just use one movement point well no she could stay there because her uh, attack is range two so she could attack either of these spots here because one two one two all right so for her second action she's going to attack here using her basic attack which is uh, roll three dice, hit on three plus, and for each hit of six, um, she gets to roll an additional die. So, all right, she's going to roll three dice. She's going to attack this zone here. All right, she got two hits. This is a miss, 
but she got a six, which lets her roll an additional die. Uh, well, I should have taken those other ones out. I don't know what I got. So we'll just say it was two hits. So she removes these two guys, and that gives her two treasure, because one for each of those crew that she killed. All right, so she's used two actions. She's going to use another action now to do her basic attack again. Um, so she'll roll three more dice. And she got one, two, three hits because she hits on three plus. There's only two guys right there, so the first two uh, hits will eliminate these two guys. That will give her two more treasure. And then the third hit she got can be applied to the wheel. And so she will apply it there. So it can take up to six um, hits. And she's finished all her actions, but it's still her activation. She's going to spend her treasure to get to... She needs to spend three treasure to get her smelter bomb uh, skill attack. So she'll place that. And that lets her discard any number of treasure before rolling hits. Deal plus one damage per treasure discarded. So uh, that she's going to be done with that. That's going to be the end of her activation. So she'll put an activation token. All right, it's the Deep Lord's turn. Um, the Brute has not been activated yet, so he's going to deploy. He'll deploy on this deployment zone right next to uh, Gabriella, and then he's going to use his first action as an attack. He's going to use his basic attack blowhole, um, so he gets four dice and hits on four plus. And I dropped a dice. All right, four dice and hits on four plus. Uh, that one's kind of sketchy, but I'd say it's not a hit. So he gets two hits, and he can push a hero up to one zone, so he's gonna he's not gonna elect to push her yet since he has two more attacks. So he'll just get the two hits and apply those to her. She can take up to six. Alright, for his second action, he's gonna do his basic attack again. Remember the basic attack is the only skill you can use more than once on a activation. Oh, he just got one hit that time. So he still won't push her, even though he has the option to. He'll apply that one hit, and for his third action, he will attack once again. And two of mine rolled out. One of those is a hit. Alright, one, two, three hits. So that is going to be enough to kill her. Three more hits, that's going to equal her six. So she is KO'd. So now we clear her uh, wound tokens. Ishmael will get three treasure for KOing a hero, and that gives uh, one victory point to this faction side. All right, that is uh, all his actions, so all he can do. So he'll get an activation token. All right, back to Maria de la Muerte's turn. Um, let's say they're, just to show something different, we'll say they're going to activate their crew. So first thing, they deploy two deck hands on three deployment points. Um, so they'll put two on this one. They'll put two on this one and two on this one then they get two bosons and deploy them um, on deployment points as they see fit so we'll have them put one bosun here and we'll have them put one bosun up here all right, now they can move and attack with their crew and then fire their deck gun or fire their deck gun and then move and attack with their crew. So we'll have them move and attack with their crew first. So, all right, so following the pattern, these guys should move. These guys will move one zone, so they will go there. 
these guys will move here these guys will move here and these guys will move here these guys will move forward and these guys will move here all right that's the move and there's nobody for them to attack at this point so now we'll just fire our deck gun we'll choose the brute as the target the deck gun is roll four dice and hit on four plus so two hits to uh, Ishmael the brute he can take 12 so he's got a long way to go um, so that's it now our crew for the Maria de la Muerte has been activated. All right, back to this player's turn. I'll, they'll deploy, activate at Kyria and Carl, and they'll deploy her, her and him here. And now they can take their three actions. So for their first action, they're going to move, they do a move action. So they'll spend one movement point to move here, and then they're going to try to spend another movement point to rig to this spot so they just need a two or better let me get these other dice out of here good so successful all right she'll use her second action to attack this zone right here with these deck hands her basic attack uh, is three dice and hits on three plus she could actually hit from two zones away, but uh, she's just one zone away. Oh, so three hits. Sweet. So three hits. These guys will be removed. That gives her three treasure. All right. She still has one more action, but before she does that, she's going to spend three treasure to get one of her upgrades. Or she could upgrade this attack, um, whichever one. We'll say she's going to upgrade this action. So she's going to spend the three treasures she just got and upgrade this attack action. And it just gives her, she can prioritize heroes, which she already had, but it lets her gain plus one to hit and plus one to range. If she had not moved this turn, well, she has moved this turn, so that doesn't really matter. But uh, she will... Since she has a range of two, instead of just attacking this zone that only has one guy, she's going to attack this zone, one, two, or one, two. So she can attack that zone. So she got two hits. Now, um, they have to be applied in the priority order, so she can't apply one to the bosun because there's two uh, regular... Uh, deck hands there so her hits have to be applied to them first so she'll do that but that gives her two more treasure and that's going to end her activation all right so i'm going to play ahead a little bit off camera until we get to something we haven't seen yet all right i've played ahead a little bit the Deep Lords have activated their crew. They move. Now they're going to attack. This group of crew right here is going to attack uh, Latigo here. So there's four of them. They're all deck hands. So they roll. So we roll four dice and they hit on a four plus. Yeah, this one rolled out. Let's make sure we don't. Oh, so four hits. All right, so we'll take a three and a one. None of the other crew are in a position to attack. But now we fire the deck gun, and they're going to fire the deck gun at El Latigo as well. So it's four dice hitting on four plus. Um, that one's kind of sketchy. I'm going to re-roll that one. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, so we'll say three more hits. So he's not quite dead, but he's pretty close. All right, but he's still alive. 
All right, that's going to be the end of the cruise activation. So this side, the Deep Lords have activated everyone they can activate. The, the Maria de la Muerte can still activate uh, Viana, their captain. But first, they're going to play a Tide card. This one doesn't have any uh, crack and pool cost, but they can remove up to three. It's on a friendly turn. Remove up to three damage in all conditions from one friendly hero. So they will move three damage from El Latigo there. All right, she's going to activate. Oh, and at the beginning, when Viana activates, steal up to one treasure from an enemy hero and place it on a friendly hero. If you have less victory points than your enemy, steal up to two. We do have less victory points, so she can steal two treasure. So she'll steal it from Ishmael there, and she'll put it on herself. All right, so now she's going to go to a deployment point right up here. And then she will attack um, Kyria and Carl there um, for her first action. She gets to roll four, di four dice, hits on a four plus. And for each hit of a six, one friendly hero gains a treasure. Uh, hits on four plus, so just one hit, unfortunately. So we got to play apply one hit to Kiri and Carl, but because one of her hits was a six, um, one friendly hero gains a treasure, and she will take that. Then she's going to play this uh, tide card when a oh when a hen enemy hero gains treasure, so she can't play that one. All right, well that was only her first action, so her second action she's going to attack again. That's two more hits, and one of them is a six, so another treasure. And she'll take that one herself, and we apply two more hits to Kyria and Carl, who can only take six. And again, for her last action, Bayana will attack again, and just one hit. All right, so that's going to be an activation token for her and now everybody's activated that can activate it so now on we'll go so now we'll go to the next phase which is the uh, unleash the kraken phase so this is when each side would roll each roll one dice and if the total was less than um, or equal to the total of the kraken pool but the kraken pool is at zero so there's no point in even rolling because we can't get less than that so the kraken is not going to be unleashed there just wasn't enough tide cards. Uh, only one tide card was played, and it didn't even have a Kraken pool symbol on it. So now we finally go to the recovery phase. So first, heroes can discard and draw any new uh, back up to three tide cards if they want. So I think this player is going to discard uh, one two tied cards and they'll draw two more back into their hand. This player is not going to discard any but they did play one so they'll draw one back in their hand to be up to three. Alright next if any heroes had a dead man's coin on the light side it would be removed and they could be deployed this next round as normal but the only dead man's coin is Gabriella. Um, who has it on the dark side. So now we will flip that to the light side and uh, she will remain um, where she cannot be activated in this next round but at the end of the next round in the recovery phase that coin will be removed and then she'll be able to be deployed in the following round. So getting uh, KO'd when you're already ha have already been activated it ends up making you skip a whole round so not good for her but uh, now we remove all the activation tokens from crew and heroes that don't have a dead man's coin like so now we'll move the first player token over 
and the Maria de la Muerte player will be first starting this next round. I'll go ahead and play a few more turns just to see if anything else comes up that we haven't seen but I mean pretty much we've done a full round so I mean you should have a good idea but uh, let's I'll, I'll do a little bit more just to see if maybe we can raise the crack and pool or see something else happen that we haven't seen all right so Maria de la Muerte will say that uh, this player is going to have El Latigo activate he's already on the board so he doesn't need to be deployed uh, first he's going to target this zone with, with his basic attack so uh, he's going to roll three dice and hit on three plus and he has this power where if this attack uh, KO'd any deck hands which that's what he's attacking a zone with four deck hands then he gets to uh, deploy one deck hand into a zone containing crew so that would be one of the zones uh, of Maria de la Muerte that contains crew. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but there is no limit to the amount of crew that can be in a zone. Alright, so let's do his attack. Three dice hitting on three plus. Oh, Lord. No hits. Alright, he's going to use his second action to attack there again. Alright, this time he gets three hits, so that'll eliminate three of those deck hands so he gets to place three deck hands well no I guess he only gets to place one it says if this attack KO'd any deck hands then deploy one deck hand into a zone so he just gets to deploy one and we'll say he's gonna deploy it there but he should get three treasure for eliminating three deck hands so he'll take that and he still has one uh, action left he's gonna go ahead and spend these three to level up his reaction here oops so he leveled this one up um, it's a reaction when an enemy hero would gain treasure from KO and crew then then that enemy player will choose either if the uh, one of my heroes or this this faction's heroes gains that treasure instead or that enemy hero suffers one damage per uh, treasure gained and then once that's been done you have to flip this back all right and he'll spend his last action to attack ishmael here um, and he's going to play this tide card uh, when a friendly hero attacks, that hero gains one treasure per hit this attack. So hopefully he gets some hits. He hits on three plus. So two hits. So two hits go on Ishmael. And then from his tide card, he gets a one treasure per hit. So that's two treasure. And that's going to end his turn, so he will put an activation token. All right, um, we'll have him activate uh, Carcarius. Remember, he fell overboard last time before he could do anything. So since he's off the board, he has to go on to a deployment point. So we'll have him go here. And then for his first action, he'll attack Latigo. He rolls four dice and hits on four. So two hits. And that puts Latigo at six. He can take eight. So for his second action, he's going to attack Latigo again. And Latigo. Uh, so two more hits. Now he would, because he got a six, he would cause the condition bleed but that's going to be enough to KO Latigo anyway so he would lose that condition at this point anyway so we'll just remove these remove his figure and because he was had already activated he gets a dead man's coin on the dark side and then that's going to be uh, one victory point for the deep lords and three treasure 
for Carcarius. And he still has one more action. He's just attacked twice. He has one more action. He's going to uh, do a move action. So he'll spend one movement point here. And then he's going to try once again to uh, use the rigging uh, to rig over here. He's going to do a rigging check to this space. So he needs two or better. <laughs> Carcarius, he better quit trying to rig. All right. He falls in the water again. Oh, and I just noticed that uh, the Morea de la Muerte had this Tide card when a friendly hero suffers damage, prevent all damage to that hero. They should have played that, and El Latigo wouldn't have been eliminated, but oh well, I didn't notice I had it. Uh, let's have them go ahead and activate their crew. So first they get two deck hands, um, three friendly deployment points. And then two bosons. We'll put one there and one there. All right, now they can move and attack with their crew or fire their gun in whichever order they want. They're going to go ahead and move and attack with their crew. So first these guys will move here. These guys will move here. These guys will move here. These guys will move here, these guys will move here, these guys will move here, these two move here, this guy will move here, and, and these guys will move here. Alright, let's move. So now uh, crew can attack. So uh, let's see, it looks like we can attack uh, with this crew here. So this crew is going to attack this zone, but wait, the Deep Lords are going to play this card anytime. Target one gangplank, KO, KO all crew in that zone, roll a die for each hero in that zone, knocking them overboard. Well, there's no heroes, but they're going to KO all the crew in that zone. Now, because that's crew. KOing crew, there's no, uh, or a tide card KOing crew, there's no uh, gold gained by anybody. So that sucks, but for the Maria de la Muerte, um, the only place else I see where they can attack is up here. They can attack these guys. So that's two uh, deck hands, so they just get two dice hitting on four plus. So they got one hit, so they'll eliminate one of these guys. And then this bosun can attack, uh, and what's her name? Kyria and Carl. So he just gets two dice and hits on three plus. So he gets one hit. So he'll apply that to her. She's almost eliminated. So we haven't fired the deck gun yet. We'll go ahead and fire the deck gun at Kiri and Carl there. We just need one hit. The deck gun has uh, four dice, hits on four plus. So we got that. So she is KO'd. She'll go on her thing. Now she hadn't activated yet, so she gets a dead man coin uh, with the shiny side up. So that gives them Rea de la Muerte one victory point for KOing her. And since that KO did not originate from a hero, then a hero doesn't gain three gold, but each um, hero on the Maria de la Muerte side will gain one gold. So that'll be one gold for each of them. And now we need to put an activation token on their crew, because their crew is activated. Well, I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up there. I think you've seen how the game plays. Um, I forgot when, when this card was played, the Kraken Pool should have been increased by one, because there was one Kraken Pool icon on that, so should have increased it by one. I don't think any of the ones that were played 
today by this faction had one no so it's only at one currently but uh, anyway you can, another way to increase the crack and pull that I think I talked about is this player can increase it if he wants to use this power um, that he has and uh, there's like I said there's some other uh, cards that you know most of these seem to increase it by one that there are some that increase it by two so it will get up there as the game goes on and then there's the chance of the Kraken coming out but um, for the most part we've seen uh, the rules and how they work so I'm going to wrap it up I think this is a fun game as I mentioned at the beginning I've only played it uh, one time with another player I did play it solo the other day but I hope to play this here in about two weeks with a friend of mine. So I think it's a fun game. Uh, I don't know how available it is anymore or how available the other factions are anymore. But, uh, you know, it's it's a medium length game, I guess. Not, not super quick, but not super long. And it's fun. So I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.